All right, so we're going to do population ecology, which is chapter 19. Uh, I don't know what is with this Camtasia thing. I'm not trying to do Camtasia. All right, what is population ecology again? Do you guys remember definition-wise? Population ecology. Anybody remember? Population. Focus is on a population's density and growth. And yes, very good. It's talking about population's density and growth. What is population? The group within a species. Yeah, it's all the individuals within one species, the same species, right? So that's what population is, and uh, population ecology, we're looking at that particular population's density and growth. So when we're talking about uh, population ecology, we're looking at the size of the population. So how many individuals are in that population? Okay, so here we have a picture of Naruto uh, with his replication. Yes, uh, and then we have, uh, we're not only looking at the number of individuals inside of the population, but also the age groups within that population. So how young or how old um, um, the individuals within that population are. <coughs> and finally, we have, oh, not finally, but we also talk about the density of it as well. So we talk about how uh, population uh, density in general is just the amount of individual given a uh, particular area or volume. Area when we're talking about terrestrial species, but volume when we're talking about more aquatic species, right? Because since we're dealing with uh, the vertical aspect of it as well uh, as the lateral aspect. And finally, we have the population dynamics, which is just the study between the interactions of the biotic uh, factors and also the abiotic factors that are involved. So all these are um, part of what population ecology studies for. So we already talked about in this, this previous slide what population density is all about. It's just the amount of individual given a particular area or volume. So going on that uh, fact, if you were given this information, counted 200 oak trees in a 50 kilometer radius, uh, sorry, square foot, uh, what is the population density then? How would you calculate this out? Uh, the number, so the population density is 200? Okay, it's All 200 right. oak trees within 50 kilometer square oh. Square kilometers. So, how would you figure out the population density of the oak trees? Is that a ratio? It's kind of okay. A ratio, okay. So, so how this, would you go about it? Two, three, one, four to one. Okay, four to one. That's the ratio. Okay, but uh, if you were going to say how many oak trees oh, per kilometer? Oak trees per kilometer. Yes. How did you do that? Um, I just. Okay, so another way of doing it is dividing 50, right, yeah. into 200. So you come up with four, right? Yeah. So you end up having four oak trees. <laughs> Sorry for, yeah, my fancy. I got to use a mouse. That's, I can't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't help me. So, yeah, that's six. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, <laughs> took me five minutes just to write that out. But anyways, uh, so that's how you would calculate the population density, right? You're given the amount of individuals and then the area or volume of it. And then all you have to do is just divide the volume or area of it by the amount of individuals. So um, you end up having, and 
another way of doing it, if, if you had 200 oak trees, right? And if you were just doing like a ratio kind of thing, 50 kilometers squared, right? And at the very end, we want oaks trees per kilometer squared. So you just try to uh, divide it by either multiplying, sorry, dividing just these two, so these cancel out. 20 divided by five is four. So you have four oak trees per kilometer squared. Okay. Good? Yep. Okay. Kind of simple arithmetic, but um, it's harder to see when you're given just words, right? So um, hopefully you guys could do something similar later. So uh, not only did we look at uh, the density, right, uh, of population density, we're also looking at the age structure. And what the age structure is is just uh, the distribution of the different ages within that population. And um, this can help the ecologist to see any kind of details that cannot be seen within the population density. So it gives you a little bit more information than just seeing the how much oak trees are in this kilometer. You'll, you get to see like how old are these oak trees compared to these oak trees here type of thing. So with this information you can see the history of that particular population survival and also the re reproduction success or failure rates and how it relates to environmental factors. So when we look at this particular uh, figure here on the bottom right hand side here this is a finch um, that, um, and, and looking at this particular population age structure here on this graph, what can you tell me about this particular graph? Denser population of a certain age. Okay, fish. so which one's uh, the most? Yeah, uh, the, the finches that are four years old tends to be more numerous, right? So, and what about ages two and three? There's nothing there, okay. So what can we say about four years ago? What could have happened to cause this spike in growth? Tough winter? If it's a tough winter, will you have more individual or less individual? You'll have less, right? So four years ago, you wouldn't have a tough winter, uh, tough winter or something like that because you actually have a lot of individuals. Oh, I see. Yeah. So instead you have, I don't know. What if, I, okay, here's a clue. What if they eat this, you know, the particular fruits on the cactus or something like that? Oh. Well, then they, they um, fed off. So four years ago, did they have a lot of food or not enough food? They have a lot of food, right? So what can you tell me maybe will happen? If they have a lot of food, the weather, what is the weather like? Nice, sunny, warm, and what, they will need a lot of water, right? Probably a lot of rainfall as well to produce a lot of these cactus and for them to actually eat the fruits and have enough to have this boom in um, uh, growth and reproduction, right? How about if we're talking about two and three years ago then, what happened then? A drought, right? If there's a drought, then a lot of the cactuses die. If they die, there's not enough food for the finches, so they end up dying and not reproducing that many individuals. So it's a little different from the population density where you're just seeing how much individuals in a given area. Now you can see their history a little bit, not only from their history, what kind of uh, environmental factors and other fa abiotic factors that are involved with this. Okay, another type of information that population ecologists can use is the survivalship curve. And this is just a graph that shows the amount of individuals that are alive at certain ages. Okay, there is this type one that you see over here. This type one um, survivorship curve as you can see, a lot of these, or you tell me, what, what is this type one showing you? If you're looking at this. Say it? No, I didn't hear you. <laughs> no. 
very high lifespan, meaning that you know, even when they're born, right, they have a, a low mor mortality rate, meaning they, they stay alive. And they continue to stay alive throughout their entire lifespan, all the way until <coughs> the very end of it, their age, right? And then there's not that many people left. Um, so, uh, yeah, their lifespan tends to be longer. They tend to survive throughout their, uh, all the different types of ages, all the way until the very end where they die off. Okay, so these type one individuals, they tend to uh, survive throughout their entire life. Um, these individuals also tend to have these uh, rituals where they end up nurturing their children um, and also having very few offsprings for them to be able to nurture their ch children. So it provides care for them so that they are able to survive uh, uh, very long. So typically, us mammals, right? We tend to not have that many children. Well, most of us don't, right? Uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking about octomom and stuff, but anyway. Uh, but we're talking about so other mammals as well. In general, most mammals tend to have fewer children, but they take a lot of care for their children until they grow up. And then we have type 2, which is shown as the black line here. And this one is just basically a constant, constant survival rate throughout time. Uh, so they tend to, there's a lot at the beginning, but during mid-age, half of them die, and then towards the end of their age, um, a lot, of, all of them die, of course. Uh, so it's a constant rate, basically, of uh, how long they survive and how many of them survive during that period of time. So invertebrates, some invertebrates, lizards, rodents, share this type 2. Finally, we have type 3, as shown here on the bottom. So tell me more about type 3, how, what, it, what is happening in type 3 over here. Very good. They get picked off very easily at a very young age, right? Over here. Um, the few percentage, like within less than 10% here, most of them have already died off here, right? So there's not many much left uh, from 10% onwards of their lifespan. Okay, so these particular individuals, they uh, not only die at an early age, uh, but those that do survive tend to survive for the uh, duration of their lifetime. So these particular uh, creatures or species tend to have a lot of offsprings at the beginning. They have a lot of offsprings because a lot of them do get picked off um, either by predators or their living conditions. So, um, and not only that, um, because there's so many offsprings, they don't have enough time to provide that much care for each individual or else um, it just wouldn't be feasible for them to be able to do that. So they Tends to have a lot of offsprings, don't provide as much care. So, example, fishes, they tend to do that. There are some invertebrates, like the oysters, as you've seen in this diagram here. Okay. Questions regarding to this slide? Yeah, go ahead. What well, would uh, tends to have few offsprings but provide care? Uh, provides a lot of care for, for, for the, their offspring. This is the exact opposite of the type 3 um, organism. And these are general trends for, um, for them. Population growth models, these help the ecologists um, see how a population changes over time uh, depending on um, the different types of conditions. So there are two different ty types of population growth model. One is the exponential population growth model as seen on the left-hand side over here. Oops, that's a big circle. And then there's the logistic population growth on the right-hand side. And we're going to go into details for both of them. And these are like kind of like the, um, you don't really see these exactly within the actual uh, world, ecologically speaking. So the exponential one is more like hypothetically speaking. The exponential population growth is the ideal environment where you have unlimited resources. However, in real life, we don't have unlimited resources, right? We only have a finite amount. So it's not only unlimited resources, but unlimited space for them to reproduce and let the population increase. 
So of course, you're having a lot more births compared to the amount of deaths, right? To cause this to occur, to have this logistic uh, exponential growth, I mean. So notice how there's this exponential increase in population. We first start off with a few individuals and they get to reproduce. And when they reproduce, more and more continue to reproduce, right? How, not only that, if you notice, uh, not only is their uh, reproduction increased, but they tend to survive, right? They don't just reproduce and die off. So that's why the population tends to continually increase in size. There, of course, there will be a point in time where they actually do die off, but by then, they have a lot more offsprings, and they, the offsprings have their own offsprings. That's what causes this um, exponential growth. Okay. This does occur in nature. Usually, if there's some kind of natural disaster, the reason why is because that natural disaster might eliminate all competitions. So uh, if they eliminate a lot of competitions, there's nothing fighting for those resources, and they have a lot of space to expand. And so you see this exponential growth. Of course, they have a limit to it, meaning that at some point in time, um, the resources are going to be more scarce as there is more population, right? And not only that, the amount of space that to reproduce, there's going to be less space as well because of that increasing growth. The logistic population growth is uh, different because this actually at some point in time decreases in population size as the population increases um, in numbers. So they have this limiting factors to, that will end up causing it to go to carrying capacity. And what carrying capacity is, is just this part of the graph here that you see that levels off. It means that at this point in time, uh, this is the most amount of individuals that they will have. Of course, in real life, it will fluctuate up and down, but it will stay around this area here. Okay, that's the carrying capacity. So that's the maximum, like I just said, maximum population size uh, that environment can sustain. And like I said, it fluctuates up and down, um, but it stays around that area. And these, this carrying capacity uh, also uh, depends on the amount of resources that are available. So, of course, if you have more resources, then you're going to increase the amount of uh, carrying capacity there is, right? But if you have less resources, then this carrying capacity is going to go down. So what are some resources, can you guys say? Water, Water okay, good. Space. Space. Plants, yeah. If it's if, if it, that's their food, yes, or living food space, source. yeah. Predators too, right? The amount of predators that there are in in uh, around that area, right? If there's a lot more predators, what's going to happen to their um, to this capacity carrying capacity? It's going to lower, right? Because if there's a lot more predators, they're going to eat a lot more individuals, so there's not going to be that many. But if there's less, then of course it's going to increase the amount. I'm surprised that some of you all know what predator is. <laughs> Pathogens as well. What is a pathogen? Okay, like bacteria which carries diseases or something. Yeah, the pa pathogens are these diseases that will cause a decline or illness to that particular organ uh, organism. So, uh, by pathogens is negative, right? So, um, if the, the Population has a particular pathogen, it might end up killing a lot of the individuals, so decreasing the carrying capacity. And of course, we're talking about abiotic factors. Something like temperature is an abiotic factor, right? Um, if, just say, uh, some of the fishes, offspring, they uh, need to survive. Let's just say the eggs and sperm of the fishes has to be at a certain temperature in order for them to fertilize or in order for them to continue to grow and develop. However, if it tends to be a little too high in temperature, well, those eggs and sperm might not end up producing um, an offspring or those offspring won't be able to develop into mature fishes at the end. So um, these factors are also involved. 
such as temperature, the amount of water, etc. There are some regulations that, uh, that are part of the population growth. One of them is this density dependent factor. And like the name implies, it depend, it's dependent on the amount of individuals in that um, particular population. So um, these are the limiting factors that um, are within that population density. One is the intraspecific competition. And this intraspecific competition is when these individuals compete within the same species for the same resources. So there is a limit on the amount of food and nutrients available in a given area. So if you have a lot of these birds here, and they're all eating the same type of food, the more of these birds that you have, the more scarce the amount of food that they can actually obtain. So of course, if you look at this here, what is this graph telling you about? What is a clutch? Anybody know? Okay. Oh, no, no, not for a car. No, no. Clutch, uh, <laughs> as we're in this graph here. Yeah, yeah the, uh, clutch is like the, the, their, their offspring. How, how many offspring you can uh, have. Um, so that's what clutch sizes are on the left hand side here. The number of breeding pairs. So how many breeding pairs there are. And can you tell me a little bit more about this graph? Also, there are limited space of reproduction too, uh, meaning that for some birds, they need a nest, right, to have eggs in them and whatnot. Um, so if their entire place is filled with nests and they don't have their own nest, then they're not going to reproduce. Um, so in that case scenario, the amount of space available is also another factor as well for this competition. And there's also limited areas for protection from predators, right? So there are some places where it's easier to hide while others are not easier to hide from predators. So if you have a lot of individuals in a population, then you're not going to have as much hiding places for from predators. Um, and so they might get eaten up and whatnot. There's also another kind of competition where um, there's this increase in death rate uh, due to this increase in population density uh, as shown in this particular graph here. So the reason why this might occur is because there's this increase in disease or pathogen transmission. The more crowded the area is, the easier to pass along some kind of disease. There's also this increase in toxic waste, right? Like everything produces some sort of waste. Uh, and so this toxic waste, if you increase the amount of individual in a given location, there's going to be a lot of waste in that particular location as well. Also, like we said earlier, since there is limited area of space for to hide from predators, that will also increase the mortality or increase the amount of deaths due to predators as well. So as you can see over here, what is this graph trying to tell you? Yeah, as 
you increase in the amount of individuals in a given population here, the more deaths are going to occur. And like we stated, the reason why is because there's more waste, there's easier to transmit diseases, and more uh, easily to be hunted by predators as well. There's also these density independent factors, and these are f limiting factors that are not related to population density. So the last slide we we're talking about, those are uh, related to the population density. The more of a particular individual in a population, the less resources we have. The more individuals in that population, the more waste we produce, etc., etc. Here, we're not talking about population density, but uh, other limiting factors. One thing is weather changes. So um, the weather changes, uh, for example, is shown on this graph here. So the aphids, they tend to die due to a very hot temperature in dry summers. So if you look at this particular graph, that's what it's actually telling you, right? Um, you notice how there's this peak during the, the spring portion of it. So this is an ideal kind of conditions for the aphids to and so you have an increase in amount of aphids numbers and the exponential type of growth as you can see here. But notice how during the June month it gets really hot and very dry, causing a lot of these aphids to suddenly die off. And that's what causes this crash um, for them uh, in population. So that's one thing, weather changes. Another one is natural disasters. So fire, floods, storms also affect the population growth. And I got bored and I did this little thing where you have fireman has been spotted. And Blastoid uses torrent. And that's the natural disaster that's happening, right? It's a flood, right? This is fire versus flood, yeah? It is very effective. Uh, storm has appeared. Storm uses lightning attack. It is very effective. All right. So these fire floods and these natural disasters do affect population growth as well. Population cycles um, are also uh, have these regular fluctuations within the population density. So here's the example of the snowshoe hare versus the lynx. Okay, anybody can tell me anything about this? Say again? Yeah, what about the snowshoe? Okay, you do see a slight decline over the years, but over here it's pretty much stable, though, right? How is it related to the hair, though? I mean, sorry, the, the leaks. that hair population increases, the lynx, po lynx population increases. Each time the hair uh, population decreases, the lynx population decreases. Why is that? What does that tell you? So once the prey, who's the prey? The hair is the prey uh, and the lynx is the predator. So if there's a lot more hairs around, it's going to be easier, harder for the lynx to find them. Yeah. Easier to find them. And if it's easier to find them, what do you think about the reproduction rate for the lynx? Yeah. It's going to increase, right? And that's why you see that spike in um, population growth. But once you get to a particular point where you have a lot more lynx than the amount of hairs you have, then what's going to happen? It's going to decline, right? The lynx will, will not have as many resources, so they won't, they're going to die off and not reproduce as much, causing a decrease in their population. And so there's this fluctuation. And here we have a fluctuation between two particular populations. So there are kind of uh, 
different hypotheses that are going out. Be why why is there this fluctuation? So we already talked about um, how the lynx is related to the hare, but how did the snow hare increase in population to begin with? One uh, hypothesis is that the increase in population of the hare is due to this, uh, sorry, uh, increase should be increased, it should be decreased uh, population. It's due to this overgrazing cause, uh, causing a plus in the population. Okay, let me rephrase this. This snowshoe hare, because there's so many of this, this increase in population, they're going to eat up all the resources available. And there's going to eat up all these resources available that's overgrazing. That's going to cause this plus. It's going to cause this population decline. Right? If there's no more food available for them, it's going to cause a decline for them. Right? So that's one hypothesis. The other one is the one that we talked about, where we have there's these predators, uh, not only the lynx, but other predators also, that uh, there's so many hares around so that um, they, the uh, predators overly prey on the hare, causing the uh, hares to crash the population. That's the one we just talked about. Okay, so there's these two hypotheses going. And the third one is a combination of both. Maybe it's a little bit of both. One is that the hare, they eat so, there's so many of them, so they eat so much food that there's not enough to sustain themselves, and that causes a decline. But also because there's so many of hares available, the predators, it's easier to target these hares and eat them up. And so you have this combination of both happening. Within uh, population ecology, there is this conservation for endangered species. And what endangered species are, are these species that are endangered to be extinct. And one example is this red uh, cockadale um, woodpecker. However, uh, it's actually a success story that I'll talk about in just a second. Another um, uh, definition is threatened species, and these are the species that are likely to become endangered in the future. So they're not to the endangered species yet, but they are likely to become endangered soon. So one of the success stories is this red uh, cockadade um, woodpecker here. So the thing about the, these woodpeckers, they require a pine wood forest that um, they utilize for um, pecking holes into it and also uh, nesting in them. Uh, however, due to logging and also due to agriculture, there's this reduction of the amount of pine forests that there are. So what are you going to expect for the population of these woodpeckers? It's going to decline as well, correct. Not only that, people, since they are around, they don't want forest fires to occur, so they try to suppress the forest fires. If they suppress the forest fires, what's going to happen to the uh, amount of trees that are uh, available if they're suppressing the forest fires? Increase, Increase the amount of um, uh, trees inside there. However, that's actually a detriment for the, these woodpeckers because the woodpeckers, they actually need this clearing of trees um, to be able to have straight flying uh, pathways. And so that's actually beneficial for them. So these forest fires are actually beneficial for these woodpeckers. So what happened is that uh, this is a success story. So we end up um, preventing logging or preventing the cutting down of the trees. Or, uh, and also at the same time, we, we stop suppressing the fires, or we do controlled fires where we burn certain parts of it to, to be able to clear it for these woodpeckers to fly through. And now um, they are uh, having a recovery and um, instead of being uh, endangered the entire time. So for humans, we tend to be pretty greedy, and so we try to gain uh, get as much resources as possible However, uh, we also find out that if we get as much resources possible, it's going to end up causing like overgrazing or something where we end up depleting the land's nutrients, causing it to be dead for many, many years. 
So instead, we, we want to be able to gather as much resources, but at the same time, have it sustainable for future use. Okay, so this is this how we sustain uh, our resource management. So as we can see this logistic um, growth curve here, um, here we have this growth curve. And so the ideal population size that we want to uh, have is just this halfway mark of the carrying capacity. And so once we reach there, we could end up, um, uh, that's the ideal size to help repopulate that particular organism. So if we end up harvesting the resources at that particular location, it's going to um, cause another exponential growth, right? If you notice how over here, this bottom half of it, it looks like an exponential growth portion of it. And as um, the amount of um, resources deplete and amount of like disease transmission increases and stuff, then it tends to peter off from the carrying capacity. So this halfway point is the ideal point of gathering the amount, most amount of resources, but at the same time, uh, helping sustain that particular population so that uh, we can re-harvest it again at a future date. However, this um, carrying capacity is very unstable. It doesn't stay at a particular place because there's always different factors that are involved. We talked about how temperature fluctuates, right? Uh, if, if we end up having a different temperature, then we might not have enough fish or something like that. So in this particular case, uh, with this particular fish here that we harvest, um, I think it was cod, where we end up um, harvesting so much of the cod that, as you can see, um, it's not sustainable anymore, and, and it ends up not being able to repopulate itself anymore. Uh, and it's due to this harvesting too much of it that we end up causing that particular species to not be able to repopulate itself, so we don't have any more resources at the end. So uh, it's this very fine balance to achieve, because we want to get as much as we can from the resource, but at the same time, we don't want to end up causing a crash like the, this codfish here. Invasive species. And we saw a lot of invasive species today when we went to the field trip. These are the non-native uh, species that we uh, saw, or they're also called introduced species. And this, these type of species may be able to dominate the native habitats. So some of these native species, uh, invasive species are introduced accidentally when we, it's carried over or intentionally released as well. So what I mean by intentionally released are like these snakes here. Um, and these snakes, they were intentionally released. Some of them are intentionally released because they, the owners can't take care of them or they think that they're actually doing good uh, to that particular um, organism. And they release it to the environment. And however, that environment might, may not be its native environment, so it doesn't have natural predators for it. So there's nothing keeping it in check. And if they do that, then uh, these will be able to reproduce multiple times and then uh, end up uh, causing havoc to that particular ecosystem. Okay, so uh, there are certain requirements for invasive species. One of them, it has to be a compatible environment to flourish. So that means that the environment that it's introduced has to be very similar to its native environment to begin with, to be able to flourish and cause this invasion to occur. Also, it has to have a lack of predators uh, to cause them to be able to flourish as well. If they don't have as many predators, then they are able to reproduce uh, exponentially. The, this, these effects will, can cause local extinctions uh, of the native species and also they are also competing for the same resources as well. So you have native and non-native species competing for the same resources. And we saw today, remember uh, one of the grasses that I saw, uh, that we saw? You guys remember? Yeah, which one was the one that I pointed out where it's a non-native uh, species that was very dry and can cause forest fire? Fountain grass. Yeah, no? 
Okay, it was the fountain grass. <laughs> There's too many plants. Okay. <laughs> they do, uh, some non-native species tend to be very dry and can, can um, cause more intense fires as well. So how do we control some of these invasive species? One is biological control of these invasive species of these pests. So we intentionally release a natural predator of their native land um, to prey on this invas invasive uh, species. So an example of this is this um, St. John's wort, uh, which is a type of weed. This is an invasive species that is within the U.S. So what we did was we introduced this leaf beetle. And this leaf beetle uh, is the, uh, this wart's natural <coughs> predator in its native land. So when we introduced it, it ended up um, preying on this wart to basically um, um, put back the population growth of the wart. Okay? Didn't that happen with like the ladybugs, the red ladybugs, and they brought over the orange one or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's other examples of them uh, happening where they bring over a particular um, predator or that particular prey to try to eliminate the prey or control the amount of population for that prey. So this was actually a successful thing where they introduced this beetle to um, at least control, stabilize the amount of these warts that are uh, these plants. However, there's also a danger to introducing these predators, and I kind of mentioned this to a couple people when we were um, talking about it during the uh, field trip. So some of these predators that it introduced, they become an invasive species too. So an example of this are, originally there's these rats that are from India and also Asia uh, that became an invasive species uh, within uh, the U.S., damaging a lot of the sugar cane crops. So what uh, we ended up doing, we ended up introducing these mongooses into <laughs> the, the, the land and to help eat the rats. Unfortunately, these mongooses, they're not very picky eaters, so they don't only eat the rats, they eat the local uh, organisms as well. So not only are you killing uh, the rats, but you're killing a lot of local species as well. So they become a very invasive themselves. Um, unfortunately, like I think in this picture, one, one of the I think what it's eating is actually an endangered species, um, a bird. So um, yeah, it's uh, and so it's it just shows you how much we don't know about things. So we have to do a lot more. <laughs> we have to yeah do a lot more research and s testing as well to see whether or not this is going to work. Okay, so this is just acknowledgement and the different pictures I ended up using and stuff. Um, so I'm going to stop here, take a little break, and then continue onwards to the next part.